In Iran, freedom of expression is severely limited, especially for those who criticize the current leadership or its ideals. Those who will not be silenced are subject to the state's systematic brutality. These are the names of the students who have suffered at the hands of the regime. This is the story of four students. Their studies or careers were interrupted. They were separated from their families. Two lost their lives, all as a result of holding political or religious beliefs that challenged Iran's leadership. Kianush Asa had just completed his master's thesis at Iran's University of Science and Technology. He joined millions demonstrating against the election results. Mahmoud Ahmadinejad had claimed victory, despite widespread accusations of fraud. In the days following the election, Iran's security forces began a violent crackdown, killing, beating, intimidating, and arresting protesters. Kianush was drawn forward by the speeches of political leaders at a demonstration near Tehran University. Headed towards a promising future, he instead paid for this peaceful act with his life. An estimated 3.5 million students are enrolled in Iran's universities. Iran's population is young. More than two-thirds are under 30. The nation's best and brightest, a vocal group full of new ideas, the student's population is the most frequent target of government repression. Thousands have been detained, imprisoned, and interrogated for expressing their views. Countless others have been denied a future, Qualified candidates are barred from universities for their beliefs. Students have not always been the target of rulers in Iran. In the past, students have played a historic role in social and political movements. Political activism, especially among students, has been a part of the fabric of life in Iran ever since the national movement wrested control of the oil industry from the British in 1951. Thousands of students from universities and secondary schools took to the streets in support. Universities have since remained a hotbed of political activism. As the revolution began, mosques, universities and high schools became the centers for recruiting activists. Students were exposed to a range of political and religion-based groups. Some were trained to use weapons. Iranians rallied in massive numbers behind the Ayatollah Khomeini. The Shah's monarchy, which had enjoyed the backing of the United States, was toppled. At this moment, there was great hope for the possibility of change in Iran. But there was hypocrisy in the promises of Khomeini's Islamic vision. Internal tension and violence broke out across Iran as the leadership clarified a vision of an Islamic state. A revolutionary group called the Students Followers of the Imam's Line took hostages at the U.S. Embassy on November 4 with support from Khomeini. The students held 52 hostages for 444 days, damaging Iran's relationship with the U.S. for decades. Khomeini ordered the Revolutionary Council to take over the government and an Islamic constitution was voted on and adopted. In the year after the revolution, political activism on campuses briefly flourished, but as Khomeini consolidated his power, a brutal cultural revolution followed. 
all universities were closed for nearly two years. When they reopened, the faculties had been purged of non-Islamic influences. The regime outlawed protests and arrested thousands, among them many students. Before the revolution, Furuzan Abdi Pirbazari was captain of the women's national volleyball team. She also had strong political opinions. She was arrested in 1981 and held in three different prisons over seven years. While she was in prison, thousands of politically active students were executed. Furuzan was a free thinker, open-minded enough to believe that religion was a private matter. Despite torture and prolonged solitary confinement, she remained a Saramose, a prisoner who defended her political beliefs and remained steadfast. Monire Baradaran was held in two prisons with Furuzan. During the short period when we had a ball and were allowed to play in Ghazal Hassar, we enthusiastically lined up around the court in the afternoons to watch Furuzan play. I remember once her team played against a team of repenters, and Furuzan humbly participated in this game. We, of course, cheered for Furuzan's team. We wanted them to win, and they did. After the 1988 massacre, I was taken to solitary confinement, the same cell to which other women were sent in previous years. On the wall of this cell, I saw a writing that said, O oh God, help me to be a Shame Furuzan, a radiant candle of Abdi, the servant of your path. When I discovered this poem, I was saddened greatly. I knew immediately that Furuzan Abdi had written it. Furuzan had a wordplay in that sentence alluding to herself. She depicted her own principles in this sentence. I suspect, before being executed, Furuzan was probably kept in this cell. Despite threats from the government, and official death certificates that listed the cause of death as natural. To this day, families and friends gather in Khavaran Cemetery outside of Tehran. They pay respects to thousands buried in mass graves, many of them students, including Foruzan. Raised in a politically active family, Munire Baradaran was first imprisoned before the revolution. She was arrested again in 1981. Her brother was also arrested and was executed soon after. What I experienced in 1981 was beyond my imagination. Torture was indiscriminate and wide-ranging, beyond one's imagination. As you know, scores of people were executed there at that time. Twice a week, mass executions were carried out. Each time, around 100 people were executed. We could hear the firing squads from our ward. This was the face of Evin. In the summer of 1988, when the massacre was taking place, we had absolutely no contact with the outside world. There were no visitors, no newspapers, and no television. We had no news from the world outside. We knew that something terrifying was happening inside the prison, but we didn't know what it was. Our cellmates were taken away. Everybody waited her own turn. Munira spent 10 years in prison under constant threat of death. Upon her release, she fled to Germany where she works today for truth and justice for those who died or suffered as she did in Iran's prisons. 
I would be very happy if students throughout the world showed their solidarity with Iranian students who struggle for freedom. Iranian students outside Iran are fighting the same battle along with them. I think global solidarity is a beautiful thing. It is a great support for our students to know that there are others of other nationalities who think about them. Two decades after the revolution, a new generation of young Iranians question the values and the wisdom of revolutionary violence. They claim their most basic rights. They want to freely study, associate, and express themselves. They want an end to discrimination and a life with dignity. On the 7th and 8th of July in 1999, a group of Tehran University students led a peaceful demonstration protesting the government closure of a newspaper. The newspaper had investigated the brutal murders of political dissidents and pointed to agents of the government as the murderers. After the demonstration, early on July 9th, students moved to the university dormitories where security forces, plainclothes militia, and a special police force launched a violent attack. Students saw this as a shocking punishment for a peaceful protest. This incident sparked the most widespread and violent public protests in nearly two decades. A week of demonstrations and clashes followed the dormitory attacks, with an unknown number of students killed and injured by security forces in Tehran and other cities. On the one-year anniversary of these events, a 17-year-old high school student, Kyonush Sanjari, attended a protest outside the gates of Tehran University. As in the previous year, militia descended on the scene and a peaceful protest exploded in sudden violence. Before being arrested by the security forces, I was attacked by the plainclothes militia forces who beat me very badly. I remember that they were pulling my hair. The police had to save me from the grip of the paramilitary Basij and the others. They threw me in the security forces car and then took me to the section 240 of the Evin prison for solitary confinement. The first time I was arrested, it was really hard. I had no idea about prison conditions and how they interrogated people. And because of this lack of information, I was under tremendous physical and psychological pressure. We had a blindfold on when they brought us into the prison or in the interrogation room. We had to put a blindfold on when we walked through the hallways. I had a blindfold on and could not see anything when I was talking to the interrogator and was being slapped by him. The interrogators do anything possible to force you to comply with their demands. What helps you to hold up is the strong belief for which you have been arrested. I think this is the only thing that keeps the prisoners from breaking down. You face difficult moments in solitary confinement. Then I felt weak, I felt defeated. But around me, in other cells, there were others. Then you feel better knowing that there are others like you around you. In the past decades, there were prisoners in these very cells fighting for freedom. They even sacrificed their lives for it. Not only in Iran, in many other countries as well. I really thought of this, and this gave me courage. Every time I was freed from prison, I wrote down what had happened to me in prison. In 2005, my most serious charge was writing a blog. I was charged with publishing daily news about political prisoners on my blog, publishing news of someone being arrested, and publishing what's happening to political prisoners. I befriended many activists, many of whom were political prisoners or family members of political prisoners. They were in touch with me. They would call me and tell me news of their loved ones in prison. 
My blog was a window to reflect my thoughts and beliefs for me and my friends. It echoed the voices of my friends who were oppressed and imprisoned. My blog gave me the opportunity to connect to the world around me and even the world outside Iran. Kyonush's role as an activist, combined with repeat prison stays, eclipsed his hopes of studying graphic design in Iran. A day after the July 12, 2009 election, student supporters of the opposition candidates Musavi and Karubi were among the first to protest the announcement of a resounding victory by President Ahmadinejad. They could not believe such lopsided results, given a long apparent groundswell of support for the opposition. Bloggers from inside and outside of Iran posted proof that government forces immediately targeted student supporters of reformist candidates. In response, hardliners rallied in Tehran to support the re-elected president. Security forces again attacked students in their dorm rooms in Tehran and other cities. Although the demonstrations had drawn violent attacks from security forces, Kianush Asa pushed forward into the crowds on June 15, the second day of mass protests. Eyewitnesses reported Mr. Asa was shot once in the back and removed, alive, to an undetermined place. The official death certificate reported he had died four days later with a second bullet wound in his neck. Forty days after his death, videos and photos were published online of students holding a memorial march for Kianush Asa in Tehran. His friends and family mourned him publicly, defying government threats. In the wake of the summer's post-election protests, students continue to take a public stand. On November 4th, anti-American protests typically mark the anniversary of the 1979 student takeover of the U.S. Embassy. Hardliners marched as usual, but for the first time scattered across Iran, the evidence of counter-protests was too numerous to be concealed. Students, wearing the green of the protest movement, stood up for their votes and their free speech in the streets and towns across Iran. December 7th is Student Day in Iran, and marches are held each year to commemorate the three students who were killed during the Shah's rule. YouTube and blogs were full of images and descriptions of mass student marches scattered across the country, this time commemorating deaths in the post-election demonstrations. Iran became the number one topic on Twitter for 2009. Friends and classmates of Kianush Asa persuaded his older brother Kamran to join them in remembering him on student day at Science and Technology University in Tehran. Kamran stood alongside others who would not let their outrage over his brother's death go unexpressed. This act of peaceful remembrance did not go unnoticed. Agents of the regime arrested Kamran that very day. The repression continues, and still the students refuse to be silenced.